All right, welcome back to Starting With The Story. My name is John Lee, and today I have one of my best friends from college. His name is Thomas Palazzolo. He's a pretty cool dude. He, uh, we, we go way back. He takes a lot of pictures of us so you can see our journey throughout the years. And uh, just recently, he dropped a new album, and he's just dealing a lot with life and figuring things out. And I really can't wait for all of you to listen to more of his story. So here's t or he goes by t -Paz. Hey, t how we doing? <laughs> Hello, John. How are you? <laughs> I'm well, man. How are you? Yeah, it's good to finally be on the pod. Yeah, yeah. It's been, uh, what, in the making for a few weeks now? Maybe months, it has. maybe years? A few know. weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I was always like, yeah, no, I want to get on this at some point. And then you like picked this good topic that I could talk about. And I was like, yeah, yeah. amen, amen. Well, I'm glad that you're here. So... Obviously, you and I have some history. We, we've known each other for like six years now. But oh, yeah, we a do. Lot, <laughs> a lot of the people on the podcast who are listening, they might not know you at all. So if you could give them a, a little uh, brief overview of who you are, what you do, where you've come from, what you've done, and where you are now, that'd be amazing. So tell us your story. Yeah, of course. So um, let me see. Um, I'm 24 years old now. Nice. Um, which is kind of kind of wild. I know I was born <laughs> November twenty fifth in nineteen ninety four in good old Long Island. Um, nice. I grew up on Long Island, full in New York City. Um, eventually, you know, came down to Villanova. That's where I met you, mm -hmm. and a lot of some of my good friends um, from Nova. I was a mechanical engineer. I spent five years there. I did a uh, three two uh, bachelor's master's program. So I graduated. 2017 with my bachelor's in mechanical engineering and then last year with my master's which eventually took me to uh, Stryker now. I work um, as a uh, device engineer basically and I design medical instruments for uh, spinal surgeries. Hmm. So you know if you ever like break your back just like <laughs> hit me up I got connections. I do have a herniated disc. Um, no I know. Um, you don't want that? the surgery. <laughs> What is a recommendation you would give to me and any other person with a herniated disc on how to heal? Yeah, just like don't hurt it anymore. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like basically I work advice. on the Yeah, well basically like I work on the instruments. Like if the disc gets too herniated and eventually degenerates, like mm -hmm. the surgery involved to correct that is so you know, just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Like it's not fun. They just tear out the disc and you put in an implant. And that's not fun. Gotcha. You basically fuse the uh, vertebrae together. Word. Well, you know, I'll, I'll do my best to keep my back in shape. But um, thank you yeah, for dude. sharing that brief <laughs> overview of who you are, what you do. Um, what would you say is, what, what would you say kind of drove your passion for education? Because I know your story, but even now listening to it, I'm, I'm just amazed by the tenacity and the vigor of the difficulty and the I guess, majors and direction that you chose with where you wanted to study? Where do you find your drive to study so hard and um, pursue all these degrees? Mm, see, that's an interesting thing because that's something that I wish, um, you know, everyone wishes they just had a solid answer for that. They could just mm -hmm. go like, oh, this is why I want to do these things. Yeah, um, I've been yeah. doing a lot more uh, self-reflection uh, self -reflection lately. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and... Um, you know, what it came down to is that I realized that, you know, I personally um, need to kind of feel like I'm making a difference hmm. all the time, whenever I'm working, whatever I'm doing. Um, making a difference in yourself or the people? No, in you? other people's lives. Like okay. I'm making a positive impact in the world. Hmm. And that's what let me, you know, I'm pretty nerdy. I enjoy math. I enjoy that sort of thing. But, you know, there are a lot of ways you can go with math that you know, mm -hmm. you could work as an accountant, that sort of thing, where you're working with math all the time, and you're definitely helping out people, but, sorry, but at the same time, you know, you're know, you not feeling, like, direct effects. Like, mm -hmm. you're not knowing that, oh, I'm building this, and mm -hmm. it's going to go out, and some surgeon's going to use it to, like, help mm -hmm. save somebody's life, or, like, I'm going to build mm -hmm. a drug that's going to, like, you know, cure cancer, that sort of thing. Mm. So that's what really drove me um, to go into medical devices, which is where I am now. You know, I, I do find it very interesting, but, mm. you know, it took me forever to find a job because it's a much more competitive market mm. than what a lot of people do out of college. Gotcha. You know, like a lot of people who go into Harris, you know, yourself <laughs> included, 
Um, <laughs> I remember uh, one of my friends, you know, Sam. Well, you know her. I'm sure n- not all the <laughs> listeners would. But she was just like one time. She was like, "Hey, um, do you want an interview?" <laughs> Mm. And I was like, you know, I had to kind of turn it down because I that wasn't where my heart was. Mm. And it took me to like a week before graduation. But, you know, I landed on my feet and yeah. now I know that I'm making a difference. Awesome. So in regards to these devices that you're making to eventually help people or eventually implement them into the practice, um, what does that timeline look like? Do you still have that immediate, I guess, effect that you were looking for and knowing that you're making a difference with these devices? Or is there still like a several year span before um, anything you design gets to an actual doctor and they actually, you know, do the thing and fix the people? (laughs) Yeah, well, I'm lucky, I guess, because I work in our specialty instrument division, which means um, we're making specialties specifically for for doctors. Like a doctor will come in with a design, mm. and he's like, hey, um, I want you to do this, and then we make it for him. So it's a much mm. quicker turnaround than usual. You know, We do it in like one or two months, and we mm. usually get to ship it out. But, I mean, yeah, you're kind of touching on it. It's still, you know, it's good to feel that we're getting these projects out quickly, but at mm. the same time... You know, there are points when you're like, am I really making that much a difference? Like, mm-hmm. you'll go through periods where I'm just, like, launching a bunch of products or, like, doing a bunch of cab work. And I'm like, oh, I'm doing mm-hmm. it. I'm doing it. And then, yeah, paperwork. And you're like, what am I doing? Like, yeah, yeah. what am I doing around here? So so another question that um, kind of what you were just talking about kind of sparked this question to me is a lot of people have a struggle with finding what they want to do, what they want to study. And it seems like you found a way to bring or find the balance between medical and biology types things and mechanical engineering and design and that sort of thing. So how, how was that journey of trying to find the balance between those two and figure out what you want to do? And I guess what advice would you give to someone who is still looking for what they want to do? Uh, John, you give me a lot of credit here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'm a, you know, a fully hundred percent sure that of course, yeah. I'm in the right place. I mean, I think the biggest thing that I've learned um, throughout my past, like, seven months of actually, like, working in the job industry with Mm -hmm. all the ups and downs and, like, it's been a lot of soul searching. But what I realized Mm. is that, like, the vast majority of people our age, like, don't have it figured out. Like, Amen, dude. Almost, <laughs> Not a chance. almost Me nobody has no it idea. figured out. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like, mm. I think I'm on the right track, but the worst thing you can do really is get comfortable. Mm. You know, the worst thing you could do is get comfortable and just, like, stay in a place where you're like, well, you know, like, I don't really like the job or, like, Mm. I'm not sure how I feel, but the money's okay or that sort Mm. of thing. Or, like, you know, I need to do this just because I need to get by, which, Mm. you know, sometimes it is really tough. And Mm. I'm very privileged in the fact that, you know, I work a relatively well-paying job. So, Mm -hmm. thankfully, I don't have to worry too much about trying to get by. but. You have to – nobody knows. It's unfortunate. Mm. You're just kind of all swimming in the ocean together. And the only thing you could do is you can't find out what you like, but you can find out what you don't like. And you Mm. can just kind of from there narrow down to figure out, you know, what your dream job is going to be. So going along with that, you mentioned that the worst thing is being comfortable. So what are some things that you do or ways that you achieve – being uncomfortable and how do you change your, I guess, situation in order to continue that journey of exploring what you actually want to do? Oh, yeah. Well, um, when I first started, uh, I was definitely like very uncomfortable mm-hmm. <laughs> at the beginning. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think I'm starting to settle, starting to settle into a group, but I think the big reality check and <laughs> kind of my, my reality check, I'd say on a, on a weekly basis and like, God bless, like, I have a great therapist, and I talk Mm -hmm. to her on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. And pretty much every week, um, she comes in, and she's like, all right, well, how are you feeling? And she kind of goes over, I'm like, ah, it's okay, you know. And then Mm -hmm. she'll kind of pinpoint exactly, like, oh, you know, you're getting comfortable here. Like, are you really Mm -hmm. enjoying this? And you're like, no, you're right. There are aspects of this I can definitely improve on. Mm -hmm. Like, I moved from... uh, you know, Long Island to Villanova, and Villanova is surrounded by great people, and I loved mm-hmm. it. But when I went to uh, I went to work in North Jersey, and I know mm-hmm. nobody in North Jersey, mm-hmm. and so for the longest time, I've been uh, basically just you know doing nothing on the weekdays. Mm-hmm. 
because there's just I, I don't really know anyone around the area. Mm, right. But uh you know, and <laughs> lately like just going through therapy and she's been like pushing me, it's like, All right, have you been going out? Like mm. have you been looking for things? I mean mm-hmm. Oh, and it's like, why not? And like, because I don't want to. But she's like, mm. but you know, you're going to be happier if you go out and seek these things, right? Mm. Yeah, no, that's right. Like, I know if I went out and I found like a group of people that, you mm. know, I could play music with or I just have yeah. kind of interest with, like, I would be happier. But it's just so easy to get comfortable. And so I'm not necessarily saying you have to, like, you know, find a therapist, but like, mm-hmm. find people who are, you know, friends family members like Mm. you got to talk to people about it and people like you know you got to listen to other people's advice and kind of rely on other people Mm. because they're going to push you in the right direction and if you just like kind of let yourself stagnate that's the worst thing you can do for yourself yeah for sure no i i love that i resonate a lot with that and i guess another question that kind of comes to mind is when when did you kind of have that conversation with yourself to you know, take a step back and realize like, Hey, like I need to change something. I need something different, whether that be, um, finding people outside of work or finding new friends or going to a therapist or what have you, what was that decision like? And what was that process like? Yeah. So, um, this is probably going to be a relatively long story, but I think it definitely, (laughs) uh, it, this kind of feeds into, um, you know, the, the concept of fear that you want to kind the of discuss theme, this season. Man. Yeah, the, the theme. theme of fear. Yeah, yeah, amen. Concept, theme, close mm-hmm. enough. But anyways, so um, when I was in sixth grade, um, I was medically diagnosed with anxiety. Mm. And, you know, I was a little kid in middle school, and I freaked out about it. I didn't really know what that meant. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the guy uh, – the psychiatrist who I have no idea who he is now because it was so long ago. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he put me on medication and I was just like, my kind of life was ruined. Mm-hmm. Like <laughs> in middle school when I was a kid, um, mm-hmm. you know, I didn't have a lot of friends. Mm-hmm. I was definitely like, you know, struggling to get by socially. Mm-hmm. But um, at the same time, it was just like something about this doctor saying like, oh, there's something wrong with me. Mm-hmm. Just hit me the wrong way. Mm-hmm. And I was you know, really mad about it. Like yeah. as soon as I could, I stopped going on the med- I got off the medication. Like mm-hmm. luckily, I went to um, a great high school in the city where I made a lot of friends, and so I felt a lot more comfortable. Mm-hmm. And then that kind of continued into college. Now college, you know, it's easy to look back on college with rose-covered glasses. Um, yeah. It wasn't the easiest time all the time, but it was great for me. And you know, that was always chasing me in the back of my head, but I always kind of tried to just push it down just to hide it. Mm. You know, just like try to hide the negative aspects of my life. Mm. And I still knew because, you know, there are a lot of physical symptoms and manifestations of anxiety that just are very obvious, like physical yeah. tics. Like, mm-hmm. you know, it's hard for me just like physically to sit still. It's just mm-hmm. how I am. And um, you know, when you're like <laughs> sitting around, and you're like bouncing your leg up and down, up and down, and you're like, no, there's nothing wrong. You know, there's. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I got through college fine though because I just, you know, like I said before, I had such great friends and a great support network. Mm. Um, once I went to start working at my job, I didn't have that anymore. I didn't have anyone. It was a completely mm. new environment for me. Um, there was almost nobody that I knew from college or high school that was in the area. Um. I had to move to new places. Um, I tried this really bad idea of moving around in different houses on a weekly basis, which on a weekly basis. Yeah. Oh my god. Once a week. Um, <laughs> would not recommend. Zero out of ten. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That sounds really bad, stressful. Exactly. Well, that was the thing, and the problem was I lost that support network, and. Mm-hmm you know, the demons that I could kind of just like rely on other people mm-hmm. or just kind of distract myself with, they, they'd they be coming back. And mm-hmm. I was not very self-reflective. I was kind of spending my time being like, it's okay, it's okay, you're going through some rough patches, but it was getting worse and worse. Mm-hmm. Like I started, you know, the first week I came in, things were okay. I was excited to start my job, but as time went on, like I was getting you know more afraid of interacting with people. I would mm-hmm. kind of like hide in my car or eat by myself during lunch because I didn't want to talk to anyone else. Mm. I mean, I wanted mm. to talk to them. I was just like afraid to talk to them. Yeah, of course. And like I was starting to break down more and more. And 
eventually it got to the point where, you know, pretty much on a weekly basis, I'd be having panic attacks. Mm. And Goodness. I was still trying to like, <laughs> I was still trying to be like, you're okay. Like there's nothing, nothing's going on. You're okay. It's like an adjustment period, just like in denial, you know? Mm. Um, eventually it reached the point where it was, uh, let's see, like seven weeks. No, one. Yeah, like seven weeks into my job. Mm-hmm. And at some point, um, you know, I was going out on my lunch break by myself and I had a panic attack on my lunch break. Mm-hmm. And um, it took me about, you know, an hour and a half to get back into a spot where I'd be okay to go back to work. Mm-hmm. And so now I was like missing work time. And <laughs> obviously that's not good, but, you know, I was trying to hide it all from everyone else. I mean, mm-hmm. obviously, like, don't. You know, if you're about to have a panic attack, don't like stay at your desk and have a panic attack at your desk. Um, <laughs> your coworkers might be really weirded out by that. <laughs> but you know, that was the moment when I broke and I just like, you know what? This this isn't something that I can do on my own. This mm-hmm. is something that I should reach out to people and talk mm-hmm. to. And so then I called my family and I talked to my family about it. Now they they were really hurt. They were really sad. They, mm. My mom came down, and bless her heart, my mom drove like two hours mm. out to come get dinner with me, and we talked it out, and um, I started seeing a psychiatrist mm. and um, started taking medication to try to deal with my anxiety and as well as starting to see therapy. Mm. But what that made me realize is that, you know, I've been trying to hide this from mm. me for the longest time, and I realize now that that's just such a bad thing to do because one, so many people struggle with this sort of thing. Mm, yeah. It's like something like eleven to thirteen percent of people in the in the United States are diagnosed with anxiety. Oh wow. Yeah. And it's like almost like fifteen percent with depression. Mm. And so, you know, everyone has to look around. Like you almost definitely have friends or family members, people in your life who are dealing with these problems. So it's not mm. like it's an uncommon thing. It's not like having a problem like this makes you less of a person. Yeah, yeah. It's just that we all have our own crosses to bear. And, Mm. you know, if you don't look upon yourself and realize, like, okay, these are my weaknesses. Like, Mm -hmm. this is what I need to work on. Like, it's going to eventually catch up to you and it's going to destroy you. Yeah, yeah. Like, it hasn't been, you know, all sunshine uh, sunshine and rainbows since I (laughs) – you know, kind of came to the conclusion that, like, you know what, this is my burden, like, this is mm-hmm. what I have to deal with. But being open about it's been so much better because, one, I get to talk to people more. Um, mm-hmm. Two, I um, seek the help of medical professionals who, you know, mm-hmm. know what they're doing and know how to help me cope a little better. Mm-hmm. And it's made me much more social. I've been much more comfortable at work and outside of work. Awesome, man. <laughs> I've been much more comfortable at home. Mm. But it's a balance, and you just got to look into yourself and don't be afraid to bury the parts of yourself that are, you know, that you don't like, that are unsavory. Mm. Mm. Wow. Well, you know, first off, I just want to say thank you for your transparency and just, um, you know, vocalizing the struggles that you've gone through, uh, regardless of how they were in the past or if, how recent they are. I think that's really awesome. And, I think a lot of people can really resonate with that because like you mentioned, a lot of people struggle with this. So I guess the, the question I have is like, what is something, what is like the simplest thing that somebody can do who has anxiety? What is the simplest thing that they can do to, I guess, start to accept that part of them so that they can be the best them that they can be? Yeah, of course. Um, First of all, I think, you know, I was so scared um, Mm -hmm. for, the longest time of like admitting Mm. my anxiety and now I'm trying to not necessarily have like a crusade but I'm trying to one be more much more open about it just Mm. talking to other people but two to be more open about it in general just because I want people who are afraid to talk about it to be less afraid to talk about it Mm. Mm. and it's it is tough because there's still that stigma out there but you know you got to air it out so people are more comfortable dealing with it for Mm. those people who are really struggling and really need to talk to someone. Mm. But I think the best thing that uh, somebody could do really is to start making friends 
with your demons. And I know that mm. kind of makes mm. I like that. <laughs> that doesn't make that much sense, but I was thinking about the analogy before. You know, we all talk about saying like we all have our own cross to bear and we all mm. have a cross that we have to carry through our lives. Mm. You know, the cross that I have to bear is my anxiety. And, you know, you can for the longest time, like you can leave that cross on the side of the road. You can just try to walk without it. But eventually, like, you're going to have to pick it up. And if you just to ignore it this whole time, then that weight of your cross is just going to crush you. Mm. But if you take that cross, you know, you take a little walk with the cross, you hold it, you hold that burden, you know, sometimes, yeah, but when you're like, okay, I need to stop, give yourself that break, don't beat yourself up. Mm. And eventually you develop that relationship. It's like working out, you know, mm. it's like working out. <laughs> <laughs> like carrying a cross around, like the more you do it and the more frequently you do it, the easier mm. that cross becomes, the lighter right, that cross right. becomes, the further you can carry it. And it's mm. like the same thing with your anxiety or whatever, anyone's going to struggle with it. Mm -hmm. The more you face it and the more you deal with it, the easier it gets because mm. then your mind, like much like muscles, when you're building muscles, you're like building up your mind to cope with it. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, man, I, I, one, I really love that analogy. That is super awesome. And I think the, the picture of the, the cross and carrying that and putting it down and picking it up and doing things like that, I think, uh, I think that's really helpful. And I think that is super insightful for um, a piece of advice. What is something that people around can do to help someone who's going through what, whatever that the, they're going through, regardless of its anxiety or something else? What is something super simple that everyone else around them can do. Yeah, of course. So this is something that I've definitely tried to, you know, talk to my family about. Like, mm -hmm. God bless my mother because you know, she doesn't suffer <laughs> she's <pretty> from great. it. <laughs> now she's she's wonderful, but you know, she doesn't suffer from it, which is lucky. You know, she has like celiac disease. That's her cross. She can't okay. eat gluten. Which is pretty terrible. Yeah, but <laughs> dude, I love gluten. Just eat all the gluten. I know. <laughs> there was like a scare because she was diagnosed my freshman year, and there was like a two week period. Where I was like, oh my god, I might have celiac disease. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. God I don't because I don't know how I'd be able to live with that bread. Yeah. Jesus. Oh, okay. <laughs> but anyways, um, she's done a really good job of trying to reach out, and she's you know talked to me a couple of times. Be like, you know, what can I do? Like, I don't understand this disease. Like, I don't understand, like, what I can do to help because I don't mm -hmm. have that perspective. Mm -hmm. And so I'll take this as kind of a two-pronged thing. Okay, um, yeah. First off, if you if you happen to struggle with mental illness, um, use kind of – that's the sympathy thing. Mm. You know, if you know someone who – if you know someone else who struggles with mental illness, you know, talk to them frankly about your struggles mm. and, you know, let them know that they're not alone. Because one of the big things of anxiety and depression is that like the tendency that people don't want to be alone, but they kind of force themselves to be alone because they have this anxiety, like what if everyone hates me? Like, yeah, they why do I deserve that love? situation for themselves? Exactly. So yeah. the most important thing, like if you are suffering from that, is mm -hmm. to kind of reach out and be like, hey, like we're in this fight together. Like mm -hmm. you're not alone in this at all. Mm -hmm. And then for the people who don't, um, the people who don't struggle with mental health issues, um, you know, you could still definitely help. Don't necessarily try to, you know, understand what's going on mm. because, you know, the worst thing you can do is kind of make generalizations about like how someone's thinking if you don't really have that perspective. Mm -hmm. But the best thing you could do again, which is sort of the same thing, but instead of sympathy, it's empathy. Mm, and you're just yeah. making sure that like, you know, I don't know what you're going through, but I'm here for you and, you mm. know, provide comfort however you can be it through physical comfort, um, you know, emotional support, that sort of thing. Just like make mm. sure that you're not trying to, you know, talk down on them or try to project what you think they're going through if mm. you don't know what's going on. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that so much just because everyone's had their dark times or their ups and their downs and I feel like like you just mentioned one of the most comforting things is just knowing that you're not alone and that someone is there to at the very least just listen and just be with you and it doesn't have to be anything crazy it's just knowing that someone is there beside you I think that does that that does so much for somebody and you may not realize it but that simple thing alone can do wonders so I really like that Yeah I mean that was a big thing for me mm -hmm. um Especially like after graduating college and, you know, moving to a place where I didn't know anyone. 
And a while I struggled with the idea that, oh, you know, no one's around me anymore. Like struggling with, oh, do people care about me anymore? Uh, mm. I really deserve to be cared for. And mm. of course I do. Everyone does. Um, but you got to kind of, if you struggle with anxiety, you got to kind of constantly remind yourself that, yes, people do care about you. You're not alone. It's just, you know, it's different from what it used to be. They're not physically present anymore, but they're still always there if you need them. Mm. Mm. Awesome. Awesome. Now, you know, one, again, thank you so much for your transparency and just um, kind of diving into your own thoughts and sharing them with others. I think that's super helpful. And I, I just wanted to say thank you for that. And going along with our theme of fear, I can't miss the fact that, you know, things have turned around so much in the sense that you've gone from being afraid of yourself and being afraid of what you're experiencing to embracing those fears and using them to, you know, grow and become a better person. And as I know, you know, a lot of people apparently know, but you just dropped a new album for music, which I think is a huge step towards you know, overcoming fears and truly being open and present with anyone who's listening. And I love the album because it, it really, it shows who you are. And I think that's really awesome. So can you talk a little bit about how this journey of facing your fears turned into you dropping an album and where that's going? Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> so, I mean, everyone, <laughs> yeah, thanks for the shout out, of course. Um, everyone, everyone who's listening, Thomas was like a killer singer in college. He was like in an acapella group and choir. Just want you to know, John's so like, acapella he's, group. He's, <laughs> this guy's legit, everyone. So just, just be aware of what he's about to say. Is it's legit? Like he has skill. <laughs> All right, go on. <laughs> yeah, the really important thing as well is everyone needs an outlet, right? Mm, um, especially, yeah, especially if you struggle with mental health issues like I'm talking mm. about before then an outlet's like doubly important because one it's a kind of healthy way to relieve some of the stresses that you have as well as a distraction from you know any unsavory thoughts that you might be having mm. but anyways um specifically for me that tends to be music and I love creating music I love listening to music you know I was in our acapella group together for four years <laughs> and I did a lot of arranging and stuff mm. it was a blast and I started to, towards the end of last year, going into this year, mm -hmm. I started, yeah, recording some of my own music. And what I found is that I struggled a lot to kind of talk about, um, you know, to talk about some of my feelings, some of my struggles mm -hmm. in person, especially back then, you know, when I was less open about it. But yeah. I could write about it. I could write music about it. Mm -hmm. which is what I did. And I wrote a, I wrote a couple songs. Um, I wrote one of my songs, which is basically just about my struggles with depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. And, well, one, it was very therapeutic because, mm -hmm. you know, I could kind of channel my energy, like, oh, this mm -hmm. is how I'm feeling, and put it into a format that I couldn't really articulate before. Yeah. In addition, it was also like, you know, my kind of way of going to the world and be like, hey, like, hey, I'm dealing with this. This is mm -hmm. what's happening to me. Like, I'm not hiding it anymore, which is mm -hmm. kind of a nice weight off of my chest. Yeah, it's liberating, I bet. Yeah, no, it was. It was very liberating, actually. Mm -hmm. And, you know, number three, it's just a way to kind of engage myself through, you know, I played all the instruments on the album. I also, like, tried my hand at producing, which is <laughs> way more difficult than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> but kind of it was giving me um, something to push for outside of work and you know outside and whenever i was feeling lonely or whatever i could always be like well i have something to go for i have an yeah, album amen and i want to push for that because i want to complete it i want to get it done and i want to show to the world what i'm capable of mm, amen i love that so if you, if you could just give you uh give everyone a a brief overview of like the album, like the vibes, the the genre, and like a little general summary of that so that if they're interested, they can go check it out. What would you say, I guess? <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, so basically, it's called Young Professional by T-Paz, which is the name that <laughs> I went through most of my life, as John yeah. mentioned before. 
Um, it's kind of all over the place. It's mostly rock, pop punk. Um, mm. There's like an 11 minute long prog track, which I'm very proud of. One was crazy. <laughs> I I I, uh, I remember texting you saying like, dude, I've never listened to a song longer than like six minutes, so that was crazy. <laughs> yeah, well that that was a <laughs> that was a long guy, and it took forever to record, but I'm really mm. proud of how it came out. Amen. And you know, some of it, um, some of it's very autobiographical autobiographical um some of it is you know stories that i've dealt mm -hmm. with and then you know the 11 minute prog song is kind of this crazy thing that i can't really begin to describe but it kind of has yeah, a moral it's, its own animal <laughs> yeah exactly but you know kind of don't want to impress anything i'd love people to listen and kind of see how they interpret it mm -hmm. but yeah you guys should definitely give it a listen it's on spotify and apple music <laughs> amen so hit that ish up <laughs> yeah. yeah we'll definitely provide all the links and all that but uh, uh one, one last question before we get into the the closing of the interview that i had is switching gears from fear of mental illness and that battle you know a lot of people are pursuing music or trying to produce or trying to put content out there with you know the things that they love and it seems like music has been very natural to you but say music hasn't been very natural to someone and this is new and they're afraid of you know putting something out there what what kind of advice would you give to them and how they can start their music endeavors i suppose yeah um first off if you're not really you know if you have like no musical background whatsoever i'd say mm -hmm. the first thing to do is just you know try with singing mm -hmm. just you know whether or not you're like singing in the shower or something the first <laughs> thing you really got to do is just put yourself out there and mm -hmm. There's going to be a lot of fear at the beginning, but the biggest thing you could do is kind of just tackling it as much as you can. So, mm. you know, if you go out for karaoke night, like go out and sing. Like don't be yeah, afraid to. Karaoke nights are the best. <laughs> oh, yeah, they're bombs. So I get to like show my show people up. It's great. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, just kind of getting yourself out there. And it's going to be really uncomfortable at the beginning. Mm. But the more you do it, the easier it gets. I remember like, you know, we had our acapella concert at Palooza. Mm -hmm. And the first year, my sophomore year, the first year we did, I was like quaking in my boots. I was like so scared. <laughs> I was like, yeah. oh my God, what are people going to think? I'm like mm -hmm. freaking out. And then like by the time grad school, is like my last time doing Palooza. And again, mm -hmm. like this is a big concert, like a thousand people go to see it. Yeah, Like sure. it's a big deal. And, you know, I was going straight singing friggin' Bad Romance by Lady Gaga <laughs> in front of like a thousand people. And I was just like... I wasn't scared anymore because I'd done yeah. it so much. I just walked out. Instead of feeling afraid, I felt like invigorated. It was like I own the room. Amen. So, Amen. you know, just you got to start by putting yourself out there. And then from there, you know, once you're starting to get more confident, then go ahead, pick up an instrument. If you're curious, like just pick up a random instrument. I went through a phase in like um, late middle school to early high school where I just bought like five different instruments and I tried to <laughs> learn as many of them as I can. Like I have like a didgeridoo sitting That's in my crazy. corner. This I haven't touched crazy. that thing and I suck at it. I can't play it well, mm -hmm. but I tried. And you know, that's what really matters. Like you just got to try and then eventually you'll find an instrument where you'll be like, oh, like it'll just click for you. You're like, oh, I'm not bad at this. And from there you can kind of work it up and work it up. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much, man. That was gold. Um, so yeah, of course. <laughs> as as uh, you may or may not know, I like to end the interviews with three questions that I ask all my guests. But before I get into that, I just wanted to say one final huge, huge thank you for being on the podcast and sharing your story with the community, especially the the darker times in your life that have you know turned into what to me is super bright. Uh, path that you're on and I'm super happy for you and uh, you know I can't wait to you know see you again and uh, listen to your album right after this interview because that's clearly what I'm going to do and it's going to be awesome yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for being here and for sharing your story and being really transparent and vulnerable in this uh, one way video call that we have <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah of course sorry I couldn't get the video stream no just uh, if, you, if you had to like think of what I look like just imagine like a really jack dude like about <laughs> six five he's got this like great ginger beard going on uh, all right, nah I'm so kidding everyone... just like stalk John's Facebook and then find pictures of me yeah, I was the one with the you. weird different hairstyles <laughs> yeah it'll be good it'll be good they'll see the the transformation of Thomas uh, it'll, it'll be great so thank you <laughs> thank you again and uh, are you ready for the final three questions yes I'm ready 
All right, question number one. If you had, or no, what's been the favorite chapter of your life thus far? Like, geez, I've almost forgot my own questions. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm, it's okay, John. I, I got you. <laughs> well, it's definitely so far, it's got to be college. Um, mm. Specifically, like junior year to senior year mm. to uh, grad school. The main reason for that is because I felt like I was the most myself. And it took me a little while to adjust into that. It wasn't like super easy to begin with. And, you know, looking back on College of Rose Colored Glasses, of course, you, don't, you tend to forget the bad things. Mm. But I've been trying more and more to like remember like the bad moments that like actually really transformed me. Mm. But by the time I was in like junior year, senior year, like I just felt very comfortable being me, being who I am all the time and not really Amen. caring if, you know, not really caring what other people think. Mm. Out in the adult world, it's not as easy as it used to be, definitely. Yeah. I'm still mm -hmm. working on it, but I think I've definitely become a lot more myself um, in the working world, like in the adult world, than I was like six, seven months ago when I first started. Mm. Amen, amen. Second question is, if you had to give a name to the next chapter in your life, what would you name that chapter? Ooh, okay. So what I've been calling this period of my life is I've been calling it Limbo. Because <laughs> nice. I've been, um, no, I feel dude. like I'm not really an adult yet, <laughs> mm -hmm. and I'm not like I just out of college, so I'm not really a kid anymore. Mm -hmm. And I feel like a, there's still a lot of transition going on in my life. Mm -hmm. So my goal is to kind of step out of limbo and get into you know full fledged adulthood mm -hmm. in the future, and kind of be comfortable with that label of saying like, oh, I'm an adult. Yeah. I think I'm getting I'm getting like one step closer every day. I'm definitely yeah, way closer awesome. to that stage than I was before. Yeah, I definitely uh, I still am pretty uncomfortable saying I'm an adult. I'm not ready for that yet. <laughs> not at all. On it. <laughs> I mean, people like having like children that yeah. are our age and people getting married, and I'm like, Crazy. yo, wait, what's going on? <laughs> exactly. I can barely care for myself. I don't know if I could care for like yeah. other people. <laughs> Well, that's the beauty in it, you know. We all have our own journey. All, all have our own timeline. So I think we're, I think yeah. we're doing all right. We're doing all right. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I used to like com compare myself a lot more, I guess. Mm -hmm. And that's that's like the worst thing you can do. Like, don't compare mm -hmm. yourselves to other people. Yeah, I mean, sure. you know, my parents met in dental school. They were like in their late twenties. They didn't get, they didn't have me till I was like thirty-five. Like, mm -hmm. and then I have friends who like. You know, their parents got married at like age 20 and then had them like five seconds later. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Like everyone's on a different timeline. Mm -hmm. Don't be, a, don't feel like other people are pressuring you because they're not. Amen. Amen. All right. So this is our final question of today. Um, Bring it. If, I'm ready. <laughs> if you had to give a title to the book of your entire life up until this moment, what would you title that book? Ooh. Okay. Man, no, I'm not ready for this. <laughs> Bring it back. No, but um, I think that ooh, that's such a good one. I feel like I'd call it a work in progress. Mm. Amen. Amen. Because what I've what I've realized at this point is that there is no like finite end, mm. really. I always thought that coming out of college and like being in adulthood, I'd be like, boom, okay, this is it. I'm settled for life. But it's not how it is. Life is always a work in progress. You're always making changes from you know, the moment you're born to the moment you die. You're always trying different things. You're always trying to figure things out. And the sooner you kind of come to terms with that fact, mm. the more comfortable you're going to be in life. Amen. You know, the, the old uh, the old lean into discomfort trope that you always yeah. hear. Amen. It's, I love it's that so one. true. It's so <laughs> true. Yeah. Cool, cool. Well, so... You know, you survived the three questions. You survived the interview. Now's your chance. Yeah. Where can where can our listeners who have uh, been blessed by your story today? Where can they find you? Learn more about you, or hear more of your music, or what have you? Yeah. So as I mentioned before, um, I have my first album, which is titled Young Professional. Hmm. It's out on Apple Music and Spotify, wherever you get your streaming services. Hmm. Um, also, I have a SoundCloud which has basically just much, much worse quality recordings of the songs <laughs> that I have on the nice. album, mm -hmm. if you feel like looking for that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I feel like that that music kind of captures my story, and that's mm -hmm. definitely the place you want to go. If you ever do want to reach out and, you know, if you say you're uncomfortable talking about, you know, mental health to someone, because mm -hmm. I know that there are a lot of people out there who 
you know, could be struggling with mental health issues and mm. they don't feel comfortable necessarily talking to other people about it. Like, you know, mm-hmm. let me know. Yeah. I'd be happy to talk about it, especially as someone who has dealt with it and continues to struggle with it. I know mm. that just having someone there who's not completely, you know, outside of what you're experiencing that is there with you kind of in the trenches, you know, mm. it's just so beneficial to have that. So, you know, feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to help. Awesome. Awesome. One last thing uh, for all you listeners, you probably don't know this, but Thomas has perfect pitch and I think it's super fascinating. So Thomas, can you give us an F sharp to, you know, get us out of here? No. (laughs) Awesome. All right, Thomas, thank you you so much for being here. (laughs) Thank you for sharing your story and all the love, man. Stay safe. Stay you. Yeah, of course. See you.